Welcome to My Dream Big Club's YouTube channel. This channel is filled with a lot of inspiration and motivation to help you to continue to dream big and so that you can even dream bigger. Please remember to subscribe, like, and comment below. All right, Jules, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Sean. I'm happy to be here. Oh, we're, we're excited to, to, to hear you. And, and those of you that are listening are in for a wonderful treat. So Jules, we usually like to kick it off with our, our question of how would other people describe you as an individual? You know, I used to always deflect this question when I was interviewing candidates in my company. Like they would say, you know, what kind of CEO are you? How would you describe yourself? And I would say, you know, it, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what other people say. So you went right to the jugular, right? You went right to the like, the right place. Um, but I never got to hear them answer that question. But here's what I would guess people would say. Uh, a creative, independent thinker. Creative, independent thinker. Love it. Love it. So is that something that you felt growing up, you just that created creativity was just something that was just uh, innate? Yeah, I did fuel it. Um, I grew up kind of on the wrong side of the tracks in Detroit, not a lot of role models other than um, character. My parents were people of impeccable character. So that's a gift, but like professional role models, aspirations, college, all that stuff really wasn't in front of me. So I did fuel that creativity for like, how do I design my own life with books? I was like a voracious reader of the autobiographies and biographies in my Detroit public elementary school library. I lived down there and the teachers would kick me out of class to go there. You said teachers would kick you out of class? Yeah, cause I would like, I mean, I wasn't disruptive, but you know, like if I finished my work, it was more of a privilege, frankly, but I, I should say <laughs> they let me go. <laughs> it was a privilege. Um, so you mentioned your parents, right? Of, of a great character. One thing that I, that I did read about it, um, is that your your father was a um, was a skillsman skills tradesman, and he received an award for thirty straight years not missing a day at work. Yeah. First of all, wow. Um, yeah. But but it, do you feel like that's where your work ethic uh, may be derived from? Yeah, no excuses. Like, in fact, Sean, I. I I have this ring they gave him. That was the award was this, this sort of signet ring. And um, it says 30 years Ford Motor. And um, I, I wear it sometimes when I'm going to have a tough meeting. I didn't wear it today. So Sean, I wasn't expecting <laughs> trouble today. But uh, I would wear it for a pitch or some important presentation. And then, okay, so and then also like your first generation to go to college? Yes. And, and is that so college, uh, University of Michigan, by the way, go blue. Uh, yeah. That, was that always like a, a mark that you were like, hey, I, you know, I want to go to Michigan or um, like what was like the aspiration on the next steps after after high school? Well, I had a lot of imagination for um, like getting an education and it did require that, you know, I had to like think beyond the boundaries of what I could see. Um, but I, I honestly didn't have a ton of imagination about like going someplace far away because I would, I knew I could get a scholarship um, to college, but I was so young and naive. I didn't realize you might get some funding for the living expenses and travel. So I was worried about such a dumb worry, but I didn't talk to anyone about it that I couldn't afford to get to college. So I only applied locally. Um, where I knew I could like drive and there'd be no flights and um, but I am so lucky right because my my local college is University of Michigan you know it doesn't get better than that it was a great institution for me in terms of opportunity because I didn't know what I wanted to study I you know, obviously it, it, it brings in a, a diverse population from all over the place so I, I was just damn lucky I mean, you speak about the the worry, and I think as, I mean, just, I mean, human nature, there's also the sense of like knowing when and how to seek for, seek help um, in, in times of need. 
So, you know, it kind of speaks on you know, some of the, the vulnerabilities that we, we, we portray and we're, we're able to kind of push it out there so people can, can help us. Um, as you think about just even like career path and the ability to be vulnerable and put yourself out there to receive assistance, like how have you been able to, to navigate that? Um, well, I'm life? pretty crap at that, actually. So you sure as heck don't want me be, to be um, <laughs> the role model. Um, that pattern, you know, hasn't totally changed since I was a, you know, a 13 to 18 year old, whatever I was thinking about the future. Um, it's a bit of an Achilles heel for me. I tend to spin, uh, I think because I grew up having to figure it out by myself, I sort of learned to rely on myself and um, didn't develop the good habit of reaching out. It's a great habit. and. It's such a relief when I do. So I'm mainly thinking of um, business problems. You know, I've been a founder, a CEO, and there, there's a lot in that seat that's lonely and unique. And sometimes I took it to the extreme where if I would sort of break my pattern and talk to somebody, this big problem would get smaller quickly. Um, I would be provoked to think differently. So when I could remember to do it, I would have those conversations. Um, and I did do one big corrective thing. I joined a peer forum of CEOs where I'm forced, I'm still in it. I'm forced to quarterly bring a big business problem to this group with, for a lot of tough talk and accountability. So I did do something sort of institutional to, fix, to fill that, weakness of myself um but it's still a pattern i have to think of like don't spin don't sort of think you have to do everything on your own figure it out that's not true anymore you're like you're not 13 anymore so i mean let's take that though because i mean you've you've been able to build a very successful uh, company in gromit um and i think with in doing that right in the very early stages you had to really reach out and, and talk to a lot of vcs right so a lot of doors being being shut. So I think already that that exemplifies one that's that's I mean that's a lot of uh, I mean you're showing vulnerability by going out there and getting the pitch down, getting the pitch down, hoping for yeah. something to be different. Um, I guess in in doing that, right? How was the how was how was the setup in, in in really you know getting outside your element and really pushing out to to get the capital for for Grammy? Yeah, yeah. Well, I kind of see those as is um, slightly different things. Being vulnerable about I have a problem I don't know how to solve is different than going for something like making a pitch. And um, I am the queen of rejection. I think I've set a world record for rejection on many fronts <laughs> and I have a tough skin. So I have no trouble picking myself back up after rejection. And I actually at Michigan, I learned um, something that has stood me in good stead. So when I went to Michigan, like I said, I didn't know what I wanted to study. And I had done a lot of fine arts in, in uh, high school and I kind of put myself on an art diet. So I didn't like apply to any art programs at Michigan, didn't look into it, just did liberal arts, but I kind of missed it. So I took a sculpture course and I was walking down the hall of the Michigan art and design and architecture building and saw these models um, that the industrial design students had created of small appliances. And it was like this light bulb moment, like who gets to do that? Because I could see immediately this collision of like creativity, marketing and business. That sounded really cool to me. Long story short, I applied for the design program and got rejected. And my, and I was upset about it, but somehow my professor in sculpture knew I was applying, asked him what happened. I told him I didn't get in and he was like, leave it with me. Because he knew that the Dean who was making the admissions decisions was actually battling a, a serious illness. Admissions were not his top priority. Stuff was slipping through the cracks. And he said, I know your work, you're qualified. And I got in, you know, and and it made me realize that sometimes or always, almost always rejections are not personal. There are circumstances. Um, it's just not the right fit. Those kind of things are usually true. So um, I kind of like 
was able to like take that to heart forever, essentially, and deal with future rejections, which was probably my top skill. I was in sales. I got rejected from Harvard Business School the first time I applied. Like I, I had to power through stuff like that always. But that first lesson was really meaningful. Is that is that a like when it comes to dealing with rejection, do you believe that's something that people can can grow into just based on their experiences is that can it be taught or like like what do you how do how do people be how do are people more comfortable with dealing with rejection i think um i i think there there has to be you have to have an, a self narrative that talks you through it that it's not about me i'm not a loser you know i'm not um this is not personal I'm qualified for X, Y, Z, or I'm not qualified and I need to get qualified, you know, be realistic. But like in the case, my, my primary area where I experience rejection has been with investors and that's going to be the case for any entrepreneur. But when you look like me, it's gonna be higher. You don't, I don't look, you know, I don't look like Mark Zuckerberg. So, you know, you're going to experience a higher level of rejection. And I, I had to, you know, I, I never thought it was because I wasn't qualified. I had to, you know, continually remind myself that it wasn't, it, that wasn't the case. So it's your self narrative that gets you through. Like your friends will tell you, oh, they're idiots. Oh, it's their loss. But you have to believe it yourself so that you can make the pitch the next day. And I, I would do a lot to manage my own psychology because when I was raising funds, I would always have several pitches out at one time, I wasn't just approaching one investor. And you can kind of feel in it a rejection coming on when somebody's gone cold and quiet. And if I had to do a pitch, it'd be my best, like super energetic, I would not provoke that impending rejection. I wouldn't reach out to an investor I knew who was going to reject me before a new pitch because I wouldn't be as strong as I needed to be. So it's not like I didn't allow myself to feel disappointment. I knew I was gonna feel disappointment and sad and all the things you feel. And it might need a night to sort of come back, you know, from a rejection. It's not like I'm not human, but the narrative about it is really important. You know, in my case, they don't get my business and I kind of understand why, because there weren't parallel businesses they could compare it to. We were quite early um, ahead of our time. Uh, when I was first fundraising, it was economic crisis. Well, that's not personal, right? Like investors were scared. The part that was, you know, a little harder to get over was the thing I said earlier. Um, only women only get 2.6% of venture capital. Black women get 0.8% of venture capital. So, um, you know, like there's some serious bias going on there. And that, that I have to channel that. Um, into action. Like I, I can't take it personally because obviously those numbers are bigger than me. They're rejecting all women. It's not personal, but um, I've learned to channel that. Like today I wrote a letter, um, probably, probably top 10 investor in Silicon Valley. I listened to a podcast interview with him. It was fantastic. Great lessons. But he, he cited 19 people as you know, influential on him, smart thinkers, great colleagues, great board members, and they were all men. And I listened to it twice because I thought, this is a good guy. I really respect this guy. I followed him. I've seen him speak. He does not mean to be so extreme. So I listened again, like, did I miss a woman? I didn't. So I wrote him today. I wrote him a letter. Uh, I didn't go public, like, you know, go rant on Twitter about it because I want him to change. And I gave him a suggestion because his major influence is on boards. Like he sits on, he's, he's on, you know, been on dozens of boards. And if we're gonna change his perception of who's valuable and who is an influence on him, he needs to be around more women or recognize more women. I suspect he needs to be around more women. You know, if he's not citing any women in his universe. And boards would be a place where he could have a huge influence. So I told him, I really think if you were an agitator on your boards to have your boards reflect the population, gender, race, sexual identity, you'd have better investment outcomes anyway, because that's been proven statistically. But you know, he talked a lot about 
creating um, value for society and everything he does. I said, you do that too. You'd, it'd be a two for better returns, better outcomes for society. So it's a long-winded way of saying, how do I channel this sort of anger or disappointment? I've learned to channel it into like, okay, maybe I'll get him. He's one of the most influential, influential guys out there to move a little bit because I am sure he has no idea. He only said 19 male names. There's no way he did that intentionally. I guess when you think of, because we've actually done some some uh, episodes around um, access to capital for uh, people of color. And then as, as you have also been doing a lot of work around um, being able to have access to capital for women and people of color. Uh, when you see the the current narrative that's been uh, kind of portrayed today, are you are you seeing change and improvements on on the direction that that's going or just even the you know and do you think it's a more of a sense of just awareness that people just need more awareness with their behavior like what, what's, your, what's your take on that i think the media is improving the media has discovered that you know a broad swath of entrepreneurs exist and are successful and um, statistically, whether it's crowdfunding, where um, I don't have stats for people of color on crowdfunding, but women get 50% of the investments made there. So they do just fine on crowdfunding. Um, so there are places where, where um, you know, sort of non, you know, kind of homogenous entrepreneurs um, do fine. Um, where I don't see progress is in the actual investments. It's, it's, there's, there's no progress whatsoever in the numbers I track since I started tracking those numbers, people of color or women. So um, that's where I'm a little bit pushing more on the boards and the investment partners um, because that's where change will, has to happen first. Like people invest in people they're comfortable with and people that they can understand better. So, um, I'm pushing on it mainly in the venture capital area, but it's also a big issue in university endowments. Um, two representatives, Cleaver and Kennedy, just pushed one of the 25 top endowment managers at universities to, to reveal their diversity stats. And, and I've read most of the letters from the 24 who responded and it's appalling. Mm -hmm. They dodged the question, they, they're not doing enough. So, um, because I'm on the board of the University of Michigan Alumni Association, that's an area of focus for me too, because we have the um, ninth largest endowment in the US and the third largest public university endowment. So I'm pretty jazzed about the idea of, and, and, and this is not like me alone thinking of this, the two representatives did it. This is a trend in, in, in endowments. Yale just announced they were attacking this issue and the Yale uh, endowment is the most influential one. Uh, super successful, but um, you know, if we're going to really attack inequality, I think um, I think access to capital is the civil, really the civil rights issue of our time. I think it trumps education at this point. I think we've opened a lot of paths for education, but we haven't opened up access to capital and wealth creation. We've really hoarded that off in a corner with mainly white men, and um, and that's you know, where I want to have impact. So whether it's diversifying an endowment or agitating for um, better use of venture capital, more broadly applied, like the investments from venture capital should reflect the entrepreneurial population, not the demographics of the VC partners, right? They, like they should reflect customers, like they should be investing in, in companies that look like their customers not you know it would be more successful it's not as a social do good thing it's like you want you want better investments well companies that have diverse leadership teams will do better so like it's a win, -win. yeah yeah oh you got I, me going sean you got me I, you got me going on this show we can talk about something else if you want <laughs> so, so in line with that right i mean you mentioned it right like people will invest uh, with people that look like them. It's just, uh, you know, it's what they're comfortable with and it's what they've done in the past, right? So I guess let's 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 talk about the history, right? Because you you started Grommet and, and let the listeners know what it's about and especially going into it, right? 
um, you know, you're you're going against the grain, right? You're you're starting something new. And we talked about capital. We talked about people investing with people that look like them. So first, talk about what Gromit's about, and um, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So we uh, we launched in 2008, um, and the job we did was launching one product a day, a consumer product you've probably never heard of. And we did that because. Um, essentially because of the internet and technology, there were lots of unexpected entrepreneurs showing up and creating products. And along the way, crowdfunding started to make that even easier and other, other services, but nobody, these products are like all dressed up with no place to go because retailers don't take risks on young companies. It's it, the, generally their business models require like massive inventories almost day one and capital, and operational strength that doesn't exist in a startup. So retail is not a great place for these folks. The internet was a great place, but too crowded. Like how do you break through when you have no budget or no sophisticated marketing machine in your company, but you have the best product for your category. That's what we decided. Okay, somebody should create a community and a platform to give these people a leg up credibility that's independent you know you can't talk about yourself and say you're great you need an independent authority with trust to do that so we did that and we launched Fitbit soda stream uh, swell water bottles we launched otterbox we launched bananagrams idea paint um, bomba socks like big list um, one a day and um, did, I did that every day for 12 years until I left this year so when it came to like, let's, let's talk about the strategy, right? Doing one product per day. Um, I, I think a lot of times when we're, we're diving into entrepreneurship or a new business, like we're trying to, to do too much as opposed to like, you know, this is my strategy. I'm going to, I'm going to do this very well and then move on. And that's how I scale. Um, is, is that kind of what you guys are thinking? Like, let's just do one a day and focus on that. Or did it just happen to be one a day? Well, I, I think we thought it was a great way to break through. Like in a crowded world, this message of one a day was really unique. Um, the flash sales didn't even exist when we started. Like they sort of came and went, but the Groupons, et cetera, at first started with that, like here's the hot take for today. So I just knew in a crowded world, it would be a, a unique proposition and not too demanding of busy people. In fact, our first email, it would look like such a joke to you, Sean, if you saw it today. I was so proud of like defending this ridiculous email. We did it the same way for about two or three years. It was this like little tiny box floating in white with a picture and some basic information. Almost like a, it looked exactly like an Instagram post. That just that never occurred to me till just now, but we essentially invented an Instagram post in email because Instagram didn't exist. Um, and uh, you know that's how like the mindset was like let's let's keep the quality incredibly high if you're doing one a day it's almost by definition incredibly high and then not ask for too much just a quick little adventure for people every day to discover this product and we created a video story so if you click through you could learn more all original content photos video and copy about the product so, so the product, right? So people are, I mean, you're, you're launching this one product, people see that it's on the, the Gromit platform. And then when they connect to, let's say, buy a Fitbit, then there's a percentage that goes back to Gromit. Like, so what's the business yeah. model around there? Yeah, that was the business model. It's pretty straightforward um, in terms of we didn't charge the company. So we wanted to have editorial and, you know, kind of curation independence. But if um, there was an e-commerce backbone to it so that um, you could buy the product. And yeah, we had a, you know, a, a sort of wholesale retail relationship. That was important too, because um, companies like Shopify didn't exist. So the e-commerce experience, if you tried to buy something from a small brand was horrible and not very trustworthy, literally, you know, just security wise, they were, they were pretty janky sites. And it's still true for a lot of small brands. They don't do a great job with e-commerce. So it was, it was good to put the, put the purchase in one place. And that gave us, the reason we did that instead of say something more like blog-like or editorial um, was if people actually buy the product, you have meaningful data to help these companies. You can tell them, you know, who bought the product. You can 
they can use that data to get a retailer to pick up their product. So it was, you know, cash on the barrel head and that, that matters a lot in consumer products. Also the return rate, the, the reviews, so like we, we kept, you know, we continued to track the quality of the product and make sure it lived up to what we promised essentially. And if any product fell below a review threshold, if it didn't say it didn't hold up over the long term, and you know we couldn't know that with our own testing, it would we would drop it. We had to. Yeah, and, and let's talk about the. I guess when it comes to you know building it, right? We we already talked about the the access to capital. So in the in the in the beginning with the other co founder did you guys just put? Did you fund it yourselves, or you you still had like an, some angel funding? Like how did it really uh, come to be? Boy, I wish I had that that kind of family, right? Like, just go talk to dad or something. No, we had we didn't really have our, any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, we didn't have we didn't have that resource, but I did have a great friend network. I mean, one one thing, I was forty seven when we started the company, and um, the average age to start a company is in that range, and it is the most successful age. And I think one of the reasons is you know people. Why, why are people at 45, 46, 47 successful? You know people, you know people have made it, you know people have capital. So the first 350,000 in capital that went in a company came from friends of mine. And then after that was all professional investors, a initially angel investors. I raised 4.4 million in angel funding. And um, the most famous angel on our business, uh, there were two I would call famous. One is the woman who invented um, Nickelodeon and Oxygen Network, Jerry Laybourne, and the other one. To a young audience, this name won't mean anything, but he was um, right up there with Warren Buffett in the day, back in the day. Um, Peter Lynch uh, ran the most successful mutual fund probably in history, and um, and he became an investor in early days. Subsequently, um, a Japanese uh, kind of multinational company made a majority stake investment. And then Ace Hardware bought out that um, company. So I had angels and then two strategic investors. I did everything the hard way, Sean. Everything I just said is really hard. It built, it built grit, made you tough. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. I, so so you, met, you mentioned the Japanese investor, right? So um, I th I mean, you have a very, very compelling story. I believe it's with this investor on, on July 3rd, 2012. Um, oh my where, gosh! Yeah, the, I mean, I mean, share yeah. share that story. So um, I had sent kind of a hail mary email. The company was very vulnerable in at risk of dying, and I sent a hail mary email to the CEO of that company. The company called Rack Ten. The CEO is a man named Mickey Mikatani. and um, it was in May of uh, 2012. He was coming to New York and agreed to meet. He wrote right back. And we entered in subsequently into an investment conversation very quickly and um, diligence. He sent a team over to study the company. But what was happening simultaneously that he didn't know was my mother was in the end stages of a battle with colon cancer three years in. And ultimately, um, I was in Detroit where I come from um, because she was in the hospital. It, it, these were her final days. And I'm like, negotiate. it's very hard to negotiate it, you know, any deal, mm -hmm. with a, especially the large Japanese company. And um, it's hard for me to tell the story. She essentially, she, um, I got a phone call. I was staying at my childhood best friend's home and just running back and forth to the hospital. And I got, um, I got a phone call that um, that she had passed. My aunt was the person in the hospital that night, July third, the night you mentioned, and it, and there happened to also be a um, a really big thunderstorm, like only the Midwest can do. So I kind of wandered out of the room I was in and was looking at it. You know, the thunderstorm wandered back into the room, and I didn't know what to do. I mean, I felt all the things you feel when you just learned your mother just died. No matter that if you expect it and you know like do I call someone do I what do I do and I'm looking at my phone 
and you know she's died thunderstorm and i get this email saying the investment's been approved there's a, a it's called a letter of intent the letter of intent came over from tokyo at essentially the simultaneous with the time she died and the thunderstorm and I just decided like my mother was a very humble person, but she knew the battle I was in. I think she like went up to heaven and started like throwing boulders around saying like, get this deal done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm crediting her with that timing. Amen, amen. Uh, and may she rest in, uh, continue to rest in perfect peace. Um, but like, just what you describe, man, you're talking about a, a lot of emotions just going, going up and down, but um, very, very pivotal in, in what you guys have been able to do. Um, where did the inspiration come from to, to kind of give this, give this a go? Well, I wasn't looking to start a company. Um, I was, I was looking to make a mark in my career always. Um, but if I'm honest about it, the idea for the company or the need for the company came to me well before I ever did the first thing about it. I was working at play school the toy company and i noticed this is in the late 90s and uh and i didn't start the company for 10 years after that um but i noticed that our best new product ideas weren't getting to market like they would just fall off the table in the r d lab and it didn't make sense to me because we had great r d capability and i went to my boss at the time she's famous now but she wasn't then meg whitman who ran hewlett packard and ran eBay and Quibi recently. Um, she said to me, look, um, here's why we can't launch new products. We used to launch them all into small, independent, local chains. They take risk. But now, you know, we're down to four customers, Kmart, Target, Walmart, Toys R Us. And for three of them, toys aren't all that important. So it's very difficult to get a new product to market. And so like this lightning bolt sort of pissed me off mainly like this is ridiculous that four toy buyers decide what infants and toddlers see from our big company like it's crazy and I didn't really see a path to change that fast forward to just before I started the Grommet I was president of a failed professional social network we were sold to reputation.com we were competing with LinkedIn LinkedIn you know you they won you never heard of big <laughs> um, but but as a pioneer in social media because I joined that business so early and I knew how to build a community. So that's when like, I wasn't looking, I'd left, just left Zig. I was looking for thinking I was gonna get another job. And then um, I was literally like happenstance sitting in the lobby of a venture capital office, kind of being you know made to wait. I was just there for a networking meeting, like trying to find out what companies might need me. And there was an entrepreneur waiting to give his pitch. And I told him about this problem. Like it's super hard to get new products to market. And you know, somebody should build a community, a platform for that because you know, retail is letting us down. And he's like, you should do that. And uh, that was the moment I started. Like I looked around to see if someone was doing it. Just like, you know, I wrote a book last year. I wouldn't have written the book if somebody else had written it. Like it was like necessity. A lot of, you know, there, there are entrepreneurs um, who have to be like, they want to be an entrepreneur. It's part of their identity and they tend to do multiple ventures. Uh, that's, I think the more classic entrepreneur, but there, there's a smaller set that I'd put myself in, which is like, I just need to do this thing. Like, ugh, I have to do it, you know, it's necessity. And um, that's, that's where I was on this business. Like this needs to exist. Okay, I guess I'll do it. Yeah. I mean, you, you mentioned that you, you knew how to build community. So like, I mean, how, how does one build community? I think, um, especially in the beginning, you need to nurture every interaction. Like I learned this at Ziggs, the CEO was a very creative founder. And he told me um, the first thousand profiles that we bring into this platform were, will nearly determine our entire future. You've got to make sure that quality is built with intention, mm. that you know what you want, right? And with Gromit, there were two ways to do that. The quality had to be there on the side of the content, like the type of products we launched and how we told their story. But we also had um, this live sort of Q&A where the maker of a product would show up on their launch day and answer questions that anyone in the community could ask. 
and we watch that that community board like a hawk like whereas like blogs and news art article um, postings were getting such like trolls of the internet wrecking the conversation we never ever had that problem and I think it was because we we moderated so quickly like if a comment came in that was off base there was a real human being with a name and a face answering it whether it's our company employees or the maker of the product I think that helps a lot because you're not dealing with anonymous people um, but I, I had to do it personally. Like I remember once, um, once in a while, like when you have it, when you're, you're doing a new venture, there are a lot of firsts, like how do we answer this kind of comment or this question or a policy? So the founders are more involved in the beginning than they will be later when you've established patterns and behaviors in the culture. So in the very beginning, I was way involved on that community board and actually for quite a long time. And I'll never forget that um, we founded the company when internet was just getting available on planes. So quite often, if I took a flight, I was on a, you know, I was, I was unavailable. And one of these really tough comments came on in one of those first, and I was on a plane that had internet, and I, my team was like sweating it, like should we answer this, or should we, you know, should we wait for Jules to land because we don't know what to do with this one. And I, and I, you know, I like answer it because I was on the plane with internet, and they were like. Whoa! you know yay so great we got, but th that's how important it was to us to me like they were they were doing the right thing they were like sweating it should we answer this because speed matters or should we wait for Jules because you know we don't we don't have any guidance on this we haven't dealt with this before either way it would have been fine like they were just doing the right thing yeah I and mean, for what you're saying too like when it comes to you know starting a business uh building community the the first 100 or a thousand, you know, whatever that that tipping point number is, right? It's so important to really understand the captivating audience that you've already been able to build. Um, I guess my question for you, do you see that as like, that's like the model, right? As people are starting businesses, focus on the customers that you have right now, really study them, and then see how you can can scale that. Yeah, and which customers work for you? Like, I'm, a, I'm an investing partner at X Factor Ventures. And looking at investment where that's the toughest challenge in the business because um, they're figuring out which customers can scale with them profitably, efficiently, and with quality. Their customers are large institutions, so they don't control the customer behavior in any way, but there are lots of them and they have to figure out which ones are going to work for them. So when the CEO told me that was their biggest problem, I was happy she said that because that's what I kind of imagine would be their biggest problem. Okay, so uh, so your, your your time at Gromit, and then um, yeah, you have a, like a similar story. I've I read um, Steve Jobs' autobiography, and you know he he was you know quote unquote ousted from his company from Apple, and yeah. then came back. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things that uh, for people that don't know is like you you also um, had an exit from Gromit. And there's always yeah. the ability of like, hey, I started this thing, right? Um, share the story of, you know, how does how does the co-founder um, kind of get ousted or, you know, have to leave the company? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty typical. It's really, um, it's really hard for an entrepreneur to exist in a corporate environment. You know, um, large companies are very well intentioned when they invest in or acquire smaller companies but there's a natural instinct um to almost like there's almost antibodies against the little company um in the corporate culture and um so the founders barely last we actually my my co-founder and i lasted a lot, a lot longer than most uh after ace hardware acquired the majority stake of the company we were, um, we continued to lead the company for two and a half years, but we came, you know, it kind of came to, you know, just we, like, essentially we were disappointed things we were trying to get done. And, um, and I think they lost some trust in us as well. We had, I guess the core issue was um, 
we stretch the resources of the grommet extensively to try to address the ACE hardware opportunity. There was a massive opportunity. And um, <clears throat> the company went from 50% annual growth rates and, and break even pre the ACE hardware investment to uh, slowdown in growth and losses. Um, and that's on me because I was throwing a lot of resources at chasing the ACE opportunity that didn't, you know, didn't come through. So, you know, it kind of, it kind of hurt the company because he took our eye off the core ball. You, at the very beginning, Sean, you said something very wise about like, how do you focus the company on the right things and not distract it? Well, I distracted the company, you know, by pursuing this opportunity. So um, it hurt the bottom line and that was not acceptable to ACE at all. And I, and I don't blame them for that. They were consistent with what they expected. Um, but, you know, I'm sure they were disappointed that, that they didn't, didn't have the outcome, they didn't have, their stores didn't have the response to Gromit. The idea was that Gromit displays and Gromit products could be sold across the 5,000 A stores and the stores didn't respond as well as they had hoped. So, so just we that. had to go. So just just to to kind of expand on that too, right? Because you just you mentioned something around being able to to focus on the right things, and I think just as people, right, we we sometimes kind of you know lose focus on the things that we're supposed to be doing. Um, as as entrepreneurs, as people that are, are are professionals in our our journey, like like how do we how do we make sure that as we're goal setting and as we're seeking out to, to do the you know the, the big dreams um, that we're focusing on on the right things. Well, I'm going to answer this more from a life perspective than a business one, but I can translate it to business. I think, I think that, you know, in your day, in your life, you're faced with a zillion decisions on where you apply your, your effort, you know, and I think it's pretty important to actually set up two, three, four life goals. They can evolve, but when a decision's running up hard against one of those life goals, it's an important decision. And you want to solve to never have regrets for, around mm. that because you're hurting getting to your goals. Quickly, I'll tell you my three life goals. One was to make a big mark, you know, kind of a dent in the university, Steve Jobs' language. Uh, it was to sort of see the world, like get out of Detroit, get out of my little hole, you know, my little world. Um, and to be a good person. Those are my three life goals. And um, good person is very generic. And I had a very specific meaning to that. It, it means um, showing up for people, like in person, showing up when they need me. I'm not a great daily phone call chat person or anything like that. But man, something happens, big, small, good, bad, I'll be there. And so the, those are hard decisions. Like, I'll just focus on that one. Because they're never convenient. Somebody else's wedding or funeral or birth or whatever is not my schedule, right? But I'm going to be there. So I know that's a big decision when I'm making those decisions. And I usually, you know, have to pick the hard decision to show up because that's who I decided I'm going to be. And in a business, um, so I'm, I'm satisfied sitting here. I'm 61 years old and I have seen the world. You know, I, I probably should change that goal because I don't need, like, I've moved, I've done stuff. I don't need to do any more of that. I've made a dent. I don't intend that to stop. That one I'm still doing because that you can make more dents. And being a good person is ongoing, right? So I probably need to update the first goal, but the other two are still real for me. Um, but in a business, let me translate it to that. You have to decide what makes us distinctive and we'll build a competitive moat to protect our business. Mm. So in Gromit, the early days, we had no resources, like none. We couldn't build you know, effective accounting and finance or customer service or logistics or marketing. We had no resources for any of that because what little we had, we put into the two things that made us distinctive, picking the right products and telling their stories well. Like you can count on us for quality, our products might ship really slowly. We might not answer the phone as fast as we should because we can't fund those things the way we should. And it's frustrating because you've got smart people in the business who've worked in other businesses that do those things well and they know what that looks like. 
and me, I'm saying, you know, talk to the hand. We cannot fund that right now. We can only fund what will create competitive defense and distinction and make our customers happy. And there's a freedom to that, that, you know, if you, if you stick to that, that helps you make, it's like deciding against your life goals. Well, I'm deciding against these business goals to stick to what creates, creates um, competitive strength. And it was actually harder when we got our first investment, the one from Rakuten, the Japanese company, because we actually could start to do more of those things. And I was so used to like, I know this sounds strange, like to be so great to have a check, you know, money in the bank. But then I had, then I had to be a real CEO, like figure all that other stuff yeah. out too, right? And what mattered. So, you know, be careful what you wish for. When you have resources, the, the job gets harder. Yeah, it's like the it's like the idea of uh, also like I feel like uh, you know imposter syndrome in a way where you know everyone wants to like you know they're looking for growth they're looking for the investment and then when the millions of dollars come and you're like oh sh okay <laughs> <laughs> like now now I have to really go right it's like the things yeah. that we want and then it comes to us and it's like now what right so it's yeah. a, it's a very good point and it's also um, I had a I was talking to an investor who was saying one of his CEOs is way too cheap like he just won't spend any money and I and I told him well, one reason might be when you go through the pain and suffering of raising that round you want to just sit on it like you never want to be fundraising ever again <laughs> and I had this phase after our first like rack 10 investment probably for I would say it lasted more than a year where I still behaved like we had nothing. Like I remember people coming to me like saying, can I buy this $25 blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, I would say yes or no until ultimately I realized this is crazy. They should not be asked, you know, it's a waste of their time to be asking me and I should not be making $25 decisions. Um, but I stayed in that like starvation CEO founder mindset for a while just to, because the trauma of raising money was something I wanted to avoid doing anytime soon. It's a weird dynamic, you know? Yeah. You have to get over it though. So to bring context in it, how much was the, how much was the investment for? Uh, Rakuten put, let's see, 8 million into the company. You know, it's, that's, that's, there's, there's a chunk of change there. You can do some meaningful things. Um, and the 4.4 million before that had been in dribs and drabs. So I never had a chunk of change. Um, so it was a very new existence for us. Um, and then, uh, so you have a saying too, you says, uh, uh, you shouldn't fall in love with your idea until strangers do, right? Yeah. So I guess when it came to the entrepreneur journey, did you fall in love with the idea or when you saw how strangers were kind of being receptive to it, did you start to say, all right, you know, we've got something here? Yeah, I, um, you feel when you're founding something, you know, you have days when you feel like this is the best thing ever and then days you think it's insane like nobody's ever gonna like this thing it doesn't make sense the day we launched i'll never forget this email we got um from some this in this case it was a person who was a maker who had a product and she's she we woke up to this email about this long about like you have no idea what you just created there's nothing like you out there and we would get those kind of love letters all the time uh it became a regular thing that makers would write to us because they might be suffering, you know, kind of toiling away in, you know, in isolation for a very long time with a great product that they just haven't been able to get anyone to pay attention to it. And then we would, and we'd shower them, you know, all these sales and all this love and credibility and opportunities would come in from the press or retailers. And that's never ever happened to them. And so those things gave me a lot of fuel but that thing you said, I also think applies at any stage of a business where um, in, my, in my book, my book's called How We, How we Make Stuff Now. And there's a chapter on prototyping. And what you just said relates to prototyping. Like it's really important to, whether it's a digital product or a service or a physical product to get as many sort of rough prototypes in front of as many strangers as possible before, you know, you throw over your full-time job or you put in the investment to make this thing real. Um, give people a chance who don't love you and don't care about you to react to it so you can make it better 
before you actually go for it. So prototyping in the roughest form possible, I'm talking about like cardboard and paper or foam for a physical product or, you know, wireframes or screenshots for a digital product, whether they're clickable and workable or not, just people can understand things that are more visual better than words. So get something visual in front of them. There was a, um, there's a story in my book that I, there's a, a maker um, that makes a product called Buttery. It's, a, um, it's a, an innovative butter dish. And this entrepreneur, Joelle Mertz, I think has the most um, creative way of getting her prototypes evaluated of anyone I've seen or getting feedback on pricing or anything. What she does, this is such a good trick. People should steal this. She gets the cheapest, air, this is pre-COVID, cheapest airline ticket she can find, goes to her local Kentucky airport and goes from gate to gate with, you know, she's about, paid $25 to be in the airport or whatever, with either the survey she needs answered, like, would you pay 35 or $45 for this? Or the physical prototypes of her product that she needs. And she never reveals she's the entrepreneur. She's just like market research lady. And people are bored sitting in the airport and they, they're like almost wishing you'd come over to them when she, they see her. And so she gets people from all across the country and all walks of life in you know three hours, she can get whatever she wants done for $25. That's what I mean. Like these people don't know her, they don't love her, they don't care about her, but they you know, they'll give her good feedback. Yeah, I think you mentioned that she would also like go to a LAX and just take that, that quick trip and continue that. Right. You have people from all yeah. over the world, right? It's the perfect place to be. Um, that's smart, right? That's great. Yeah. Um, love it. Love it. Love it. Um, so I guess when uh I guess when it comes to like the journey and where you're at right now, um, what's next? So I, I first after I left ground and I spent four months being a hiking bum which means like I went to Maine, went to the Colorado Rockies. You know, I, I, I finally had some freedom and space. I've had a, a job I needed since I was 12. So I, I just like, couldn't believe I could like spend a little time doing what I wanted. So I did. And I came back in October and I'm doubling down on my investing in X Factor Ventures. We're early stage investing. Uh, we only invest in diverse teams founding teams and um, first capital into the company, usually any sector. So that was something I did on the side and I've, I've moved to a little more center stage, which is really fun because I feel like I'm gonna do a better job. I'm doubling down on my Michigan endowment. I mean, my Michigan Alumni Association board and I'm looking for a corporate board or two in a high growth company, 100 million plus in revenues that either in a platform that's helping products um, or companies succeed or a marketplace or a consumer product um, or a manufacturing company because I know a lot about product development. So I'm looking for those. And in the meantime, Sean, I'm trying to decide, will I get bored? Like, do I need to create something again? Or can I enjoy, you know, essentially being an assist? as a board member and investor. And I don't know yet. I don't, I, I don't know. It hasn't been, you know, I've only been on the ground for like two months in that stage of like doing a variety of activities. So I'm going to give myself time to figure that out. And you seem happy, right? So happiness Super is, is happy. key, right? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. you know, as things come, things will come, right? Just, just stay happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, uh, and then, you, you know, when it comes to, you know, I think you talk about like, you know, we're obviously my dream big club, right? So when it comes to uh, dreaming big, I think you, you know, you have a saying where you also talk about how uh, your, your ideas should be extremely large, right? Because your, your, yeah. your life is, is worth that. Um, so, so kind of, kind of speak on that sense of, you know, dreaming big and uh, what you, what you mean by that. I mean, is there a large target market? It's, it's not a complicated idea. Do a lot of people need this um, thing I'm thinking of. Let me give an example. Um, when the f first investor in Airbnb heard about the idea, the person who told him about it, told him it was basically couch surfing, like, which is not true. Like they always had a vision to rent out homes or a whole room. And 
the investor wouldn't take the meeting with Airbnb because renting out a couch for $25 or $50 is never going to be a service a lot of people want to give or receive. It's for very, very budget traveler. And it's not big enough. But renting out your home or a room in your home is a very big idea. It was opening up an inventory nobody had tapped and responding to a big traveler desire to like sort of be in a community and experience it like a local. Like that's a big idea, right? So twist on the same idea, one small, one's big. So just try to lean to that bigger one because I think it takes as much time to build the small business. The couch surfing business would have taken just as much effort with less payoff, right? And less reward for the sacrifice. Right. Love it. Love it. All right. So I'm, I'm going to take you down a, a quick lightning round. So it's like the first thing that comes to your head. Just, just shoot it out. Um, coffee or tea? Coffee. Uh, favorite day of the week? Uh, Friday. Okay. Friday. Uh, University <laughs> of Michigan or Harvard? Oh, Michigan. That's oh, go blue. Go blue on that one. <laughs> uh, I know the answer to this one. Um, ask for forgiveness or beg for permission? Oh, geez, ask for forgiveness. I used to have that on the wall in, in outside my office in Grant, which is very dangerous. This is a statement from <laughs> um, Rear Admiral Grace Bonner. Like, I'd rather ask for forgiveness than beg for permission or whatever. Imagine having a team of 20-somethings who that's what I've told them. <laughs> is, there, is, there, is there any stories where, um, you know, someone from your team, they, they did something that was, you know, it didn't make you happy, but they just said, hey, you know what? You said ask for forgiveness. <laughs> uh, once or twice, but I, we hired so well. These people had, even at their young ages, had great judgment. I, no, I never, I, I mean, no, not really. You would think, right? You know, that, that would be, <laughs> let some cowboys and cowgirls loose, but nah, they, they were great. No, oh, man. Well, this this has been great. So we, re we really appreciate it. So uh, what I want you to do You did is, your uh, homework, Sean. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm so oh, impressed. <laughs> Thank you very much. You, I appreciate it. You work it. hard. Hey, hey, you people listening here. This man worked hard. You should share this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I appreciate that very much. Um, so as it comes to you just kind of thinking about and, and leaving words of encouragement, right? So for, for our listeners, for maybe someone that is looking to take the first step or it's someone that is currently in the entrepreneur journey and it's just like, man, I am tired. But uh, leave us with some words of encouragement. Yeah, so first thing that comes to mind is at Gromit, we saw two to 300 products a week and every single week there were several that blew my mind. And they solved the problem in a new way that no one ever had before. And you would think after 12 years that would stop happening, right? It couldn't possibly happen to me every week, but it did. So here's the lesson. If you have an idea and you can't find evidence that ever, anyone has ever solved this problem or has, has fixed it, I think the world is probably just waiting for you, right? Like, don't think your idea is bad just because you can't find evidence that other people have worked on a similar idea. So, so often, like the, the world's just, just waiting for you. So take that as a sign um, for yourself. For the person who's really fatigued, um, the thing I would question there is, do you have a co-founder? Because I found that's the best antidote to fatigue. Because I had a strong co-founder, Joanne Domeniconi, and it was pretty predictable that when I was up, she was down or vice versa, and we could pull each other up. So whether it's a co-founder or a strong committed advisor who's willing to like get in the boat with you and you know navigate to shore, you can find another person to play that role, but they have to be committed. They, you know, they, they, they have to understand that's what you're expecting from them because you cannot do it alone. It's, it's a very lonely journey, even with a co-founder to do a startup, but um, I would feel it would have been impossible without her. Yeah, is there, so, in line with that, right? Like when it comes to creating uh, or having an accountability partner or having a strong sense of accountability, um, if you don't have that co-founder, um, I mean, what, what would you suggest? 
I would say um, develop a board of advisors or single advisor that um, will play that role for you. So it depends on the nature of the business, but if it's a serious advisory relationship, there should be equity for that person, like a half percent of the company. Again, it depends on the nature of the organization. And I would set up a, a formal contract with them and um, with time expectations, it's, it's useful for both parties because then there, there are no, you know, confu there's no confusion about what's expected. And you can move off from that advisor because if you're really early in your business, what you need year one is different than year two. So um, it's normal to sort of cycle people in. They have, they have to vest their equity for a year or two so that they don't sort of just walk away with it without doing the work. Um, so I think about it that way. It could be more less formal than that in many businesses where maybe there, you know, there isn't an equity opportunity, especially to say a nonprofit or something like that. But um, but there should be a formal understanding of what you need from that person, even if the contractual relationship is 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 not formal. And Jules, why should we all dream big? Oh man, you only get one life, right? Like use it. That's how I think, like, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? Like that, my brother said to me at the beginning of the business, like, what if it fails? And I was like, well, it's not like I'll be like kicked to the moon, I'll be employable. So go for it, right? And like, I love people who've tried and failed, you know, because they're smarter. You only get one life. All right, Jules, thank you very much for your time. Uh, remember that everyone that you only get one live so why not so jules thank yeah. you thank you sean i really had fun thanks hi my dream big club i'm jules from detroit please be sure to turn your ideas into action please remember to subscribe like and comment below